Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to find our text. We're going to finish chapter 1 this evening and jump into chapter 2, Lord willing, next week. And so I'm glad you're here. Uh, small victories as we go through the book of 1 Peter, finishing up chapter 1 and uh, starting chapter 2 next week. It's been a several weeks uh, since we were in the book of 1 Peter. I uh, appreciate Brother Tim Bradley who spoke the past few weeks for me, um, covering the pulpit on a Wednesday night and preached on spiritual battles. And so he's got the experience in the military, so I appreciate his uh, forward thinking in that. Uh, last, this time last week, we were finishing up our family camp in Austria. The week before that, we were sweating our faces off in Berlin uh, with dinner and church. And so it's nice to be here in the air conditioning. Uh, that's two things I'm not going to take for granted anymore. I'll probably mention this Sunday night, is uh, air conditioning and ice. Two things I don't have in Europe, all right? Uh, nothing is air conditioned over in Europe. Uh, and in Germany, it was just hot and humid and uh, miserable, if we could use that word. And uh, one night, we were having dinner together as a, as a group. There were 16 of us in a restaurant, and it was just, it was hot. And uh, just, it was uncomfortable. And apparently, the air, or there was a breeze in the women's restroom, because um, it was smaller, and they had uh, windows in the top. And so, the ladies were always go, saying, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go to the bathroom. They were going there just to cool off. Um, and so I won't take air conditioning for granted or ice. They don't serve anything with ice over there, and uh, that's kind of weird and random. Uh, and so we, we found a Starbucks downtown Berlin. We're all like, praise the Lord, all right, because they have iced coffee there. And so uh, we're grateful to be here tonight in the air conditioning and uh, looking forward to finishing up First Peter chapter 1 this evening. And um, come back on Sunday. We're going to continue uh, preaching all day. I'll be preaching all day. And then Sunday night we'll be showing some pictures as well as having some testimonies from our missions team um, as we came back, we spent two weeks, two weeks in Germany. Uh, well, a week in Germany, a week in Austria, but it was right on the other side of the border. So come on Sunday, join us for services and hear their testimonies and be challenged about missions. And looking forward to following that up really with our missions conference in October. Uh, begin praying for the Lord uh, to touch your heart and speak to your heart in that because we really want this church to be a lighthouse for the gospel. And uh, as your pastor, my goal is to see men raised up from our church to preach and to pastor, to be missionaries. And so my goal uh, is to have the next 10 years to have a man in our church either on the mission field or going out to start a church from our church uh, because we need to start uh, starting churches out of our church. That's what God's called us to do. Every living organism that God has designed reproduces after its kind. And the local church is no different. The local church should be starting other local churches. And so that's my goal as your pastor. And so that's why we've been fo focusing on missions the past several years trying to get you involved with missions so that you can get a heart for the lost in our community and worldwide. And so, Lord willing, you can pray with me on that, that we can see someone called to pastor, called to preach, called to be a missionary out of our church, um, whether we bring them in as a missionary intern and train them and then send them out, or God brings them up for own, from our own uh, uh, body, church body. Maybe Ezekiel will go over there and help and uh, pre preach in Germany. You never know. Uh, but God will raise up somebody from our church. And so pray with me about that. We want to see people uh, starting churches and being missionaries out of our church. And so that'd be fantastic. But on Sunday, join us Sunday night at 6 o'clock. We'll have testimonies from that. All right, First Peter chapter 1, we're going to jump into it. Um, just as it's been in several weeks, we're not going to go into a detailed review of chapter 1. But we are going to see what God has been teaching us so far from First Peter chapter 1. We've learned that this book was written to the Jewish and Gentile believers that were scattered abroad throughout the Asia Minor area. And so these men in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1 and women, they're scattered abroad, living in an area that was not their own. And Peter is writing this book to them because he says in chapter 5 that he wants them to remain perfect, established, strengthened, and settled. And so he wrote this epistle to them so that while they're away from home, they can still be strengthened in their faith, they can still stand in their faith, and they can still continue to grow in their faith. Because your growth is not a product of your environment. Your growth is a product of your own personal choice. Uh, there are a lot of teenagers that are in good Christian homes that are not growing in the Lord because maturity is not a result of environment. There are also other teenagers who are not in a good home, and they're thriving because they've allowed the Word of God to be part of their life, even though their parents are not believers. And so your maturity is not, a, is not conditioned 
on your environment. It's conditioned on your heart. No matter where you are, you can grow. No matter where you are in your walk with God or where you are physically, you can be strengthened in your faith, you can stand in your faith, and you can grow in your faith. And so that's why the Apostle Peter wrote this book to strengthen, settle, and perfect those who are away from home. And we're reminded that we as Christians are also strangers and pilgrims. We as Christians are in this world, but not of this world. We will never be fully accepted here because our conversation, our lifestyle, our citizenship, the Bible says in Philippians, is in heaven. So we are here away from home, learning how we can grow. We're not citizens of this world. And so how can we live for God while we are away from home? Well, the book of 1 Peter answers that question. And when we think about the book of 1 Peter, we learn how we ought to act while we are away from home. Uh, one of the big buzzwords today is identity. What is your identity? And identity is imperative in the Christian life and even in your own physical world. Because if you don't understand who you are, you'll never behave like you should. And as Christians, if we don't understand who we are in Christ, we're never going to respond and behave as Christians should, even when we are away from home even when we are scattered abroad, wherever the Lord puts us. And so the Apostle Peter, he thinks about these Christians who are scattered, about, scattered all around Asia Minor. And so he writes an epistle to them to help them understand their faith, to help them live in their faith, and to grow in their faith. And that letter is the book of First Peter. We learn from the first several verses about our salvation. The Bible talks about the salvation we have from God through Jesus Christ, by the Spirit, because of the Word of God, we can understand where we are in Christ. And so we have this idea of our salvation, and that's really the first 12 verses. And then from really from verses 3 on to the end of the chapter, uh, we have these three ideas of the Christian faith that Peter is accumulating. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the Bible says that there is faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity. Remember that? And so the Christian life, we see this idea of faith, hope, and charity all throughout the New Testament. And so what we have in 1 Peter chapter 1 is Peter taking faith, hope, and charity and using them as stepping stones in the Christian faith. We have our faith in God, our confidence in the Word of God. We have our hope, our expectation of what God is going to do to us and through us. And we have the charity that we're supposed to show one to another because of the love that was shown to us through Jesus Christ. And so what we have is really these building blocks of faith and these stepping stones. The first 12 verses of chapter 1 talk about our salvation. And then in verse 13, he says, Wherefore? So based on this salvation that you have, gird up the loins of your mind. Begin thinking right. Before you begin to try to live right and act right, you've got to think right. Gird up the loins of your mind. And then once you begin thinking right, then you can begin living right. That's verse 15 and 16. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And so we go from our salvation, living in that salvation by how we think, the next step in how we ought to live our lives, and as we live a holy life, we find ourselves living purely with love towards one another because of the word of God. And then in chapter 2 and verse 1, again, wherefore, because of all this, lay aside all of these things and desire this and serve milk with the word that you may grow thereby. And so chapter 1 is nothing really but, nothing but steps and stones for us to continue in our faith, to grow in our faith, taking us from where we are to where we need to be. And Paul uses faith, hope, and charity to bring us to where we ought to be. We're going to pick up in verse 22, because that's where we ended two weeks ago. And based on the salvation that we have, the faith that we have in God, based on the hope that we have because of our walk with God and what he's called us to be, he says in verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, 
and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. We're going to look at two main thoughts in these final verses of chapter 1 tonight. We're going to look at our pure faith and then our pure word. Whatever grows out of the Bible will have the characteristics of the word of God. And because the word of God is pure, when our faith is found in the word of God, that makes us pure. And so we're going to look at our pure faith and also the pure word of God tonight. In verse 22... Again, you can see these building blocks, these, these thoughts that build on thoughts. And the Bible says that we have obeyed the truth. It says, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. And so when you obey the truth, your soul is purified, and it's purified through the Spirit for unfeigned love of the brethren. And because we have this salvation, see that, Ye love one another fervently with a pure heart. And so we have this amazing thought. Really, we could spend the entire night, and we probably will spend most of it tonight, in verse 22, when we think about this faith that we have. We can see three things that talks about our pure faith. We can see the directive of our obedience. We can see the direction of our obedience. And lastly, we can see the duty of our obedience. He says in verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. It's an amazing reminder that when we get saved, we are pure. We have been made clean. When you obey the truth in faith, when you come to Christ in salvation, the Bible says that your soul is pure. Your soul has been washed throughly with the water of the Word. There have been a number of times, I'm sure, where you've had to take multiple showers in a day or a number of showers during the week, right? Because of the work that you're doing, because of, of the grit that you're in, because of the sweat that you're feeling. Um, when Ezekiel's probably on his dirt bike and racing and in tournaments, I'm sure he doesn't come home covered in mud and his mom says, just sit on the couch and I'll make you dinner. She probably says, get in there and wash off. Why? Because you're so dirty. And then the very next race, she probably says, Ezekiel, go take a shower. And he probably doesn't say, I just took a shower after the last race, so I'm fine after this race, right? No, because it's fresh mud, fresh dirt, right? We've all had to do that. We've taken a shower, and we got clean, then we got dirty again. And then you go to work, and you come home, and then you take a shower again because you're always getting dirty. But when you're saved, when your soul is purified through the blood of Jesus Christ, when we, take that, when we receive that salvation by faith, the Bible says our soul is pure, and it's purified forever. We now have a right standing before God. You don't have to fear standing before Him in your sin, and in your iniquity, and in the filth of your flesh. No, you've been purified. And so the Apostle, Paul said, or Apostle Peter says in verse 22, that you have purified your soul in obeying the truth. Peter gives us really a grammatical theme here. Because of this, then do that. It's almost like an if-then statement. Because of this, you have that. Because of this, you should do that. He says, because of this, seeing you have purified your soul and obeying the truth, then do that. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. The Bible says that our, our souls have been purified because we have obeyed the truth through the Spirit. Now, the Bible is full of references and examples of how a believer is to be obedient to God and to his word. Peter actually begins with this thought of obeying through the Spirit in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, when he says, We are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. And so again, we see this idea of obedience through the Spirit beginning and really even ending this chapter. Faith alone unites us to Christ. It's not our obedience that brings us into a right relationship with God. It's faith. Faith alone unites us with Christ. And Christ alone is the ground of our justification. However, our obedience is simply the fruit of that faith. If you want to have a pure heart, 
you want to stand clean before God, it does not come through works, it comes through faith. How do we know that our faith has given us this purity? Well, the Bible says your faith will show itself through good works. So as you know here at Mason Baptist Church, it's not faith and works, it's a faith that works. It's a faith that shows itself to be true. A faith that shows itself to be pure. The faith that justifies is the kind of faith that by the Holy Spirit changes us. We're sanctified. That's why he says earlier to be holy. If your faith in Christ leaves you unchanged, then you do not have saving faith. And so we have this faith because of our obedience. Now, obedience, not perfection, but this new direction of thought and desire and behavior. This obedience is the fruit that shows that your faith is alive. If your faith is not an obedient faith, then your faith is not a saving faith. That's what James talks about. That's why he says faith without works is dead. We're not talking about saving faith. Romans talks about how we're saved by faith alone. We're talking about practical faith. How do you know someone is saved? The Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them. How do you know someone is saved? By how they live their lives. Listen, by how they obey the word of God. Now, if you say you have faith and have not works, James says your faith is dead. And so if your Christian faith is not an obeying faith, listen, it is not a saving faith. The faith that saves works, and the faith that saves changes. And there are a lot of people in America who said, well, I said a prayer when I was five years old, so therefore I know I'm going to heaven. Prayer does not save anybody. It's faith that saves and the faith that saves changes us. The faith that saves will motivate us to be more like Jesus Christ. And so we know that we have purified our souls because we have obeyed. That's what the Bible says. And so if you have obeyed God and you've repented of your sin, if you have obeyed God and turned to Jesus Christ as opposed to your own self for salvation and forgiveness, the Bible says then you can have confidence that you are saved. We have the directive of obedience. We've, we're always commanded to obey. But then we see the direction of our obedience. If you look again in verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying what? The truth. The truth. That's a pretty important aspect of obedience. You better make sure the thing that you're obeying is right. And so the Bible says we obey the truth. How do we know what the truth is? Through the Holy Spirit. So that's why he says in verse 22, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead you into truth. And as the Holy Spirit leads you to truth, you obey that truth. And in obeying that, you become more conformed to Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.25, the Bible says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In other words, live like who you are. Believers will have a willingness to obey. Now, that does not mean that you're always going to obey at all times and all situations, right? None of us are that. None of us are perfect. None of us obey all the time. But there will be a desire to follow God. There will be a desire to do what is right. A Christian will not live habitually disobedient to God. There is no way someone can be saved from their sin and then continue to live in that sin. That was our entire First John series, right? If we say we have fellowship with him, we walk in the light as he is in the light. Now, are we always going to be in the light? No, sometimes we screw up. But what do we do? First John 1, 9, we confess our sin, and then we turn from that sin and get back into the light. A Christian will not habitually live in sin. There's going to be an aversion to sin, and so we have this obedience to the truth. Now, you may have an area that may trip you up from time to time, or maybe that besetting sin that you constantly struggle with. But at some point, you will confess and repent and come back to God. Why is that? Because of the life that is inside you. Now, think about this. It's not just life that's inside you. 
It is the life of Christ that is inside you. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. And so when we get saved, the Spirit of Christ lives in us, and He will lead us into all truth, the Bible says. He will lead us into this life. And so we as Christians, verse 22, we have purified our souls because we obeyed the truth. We know it's the truth because it was given to us through the Holy Spirit. And now we see the duty of our obedience. Because you have this pure faith, this true faith, what do we do? We love the brethren. We love one another. The duty of our obedience is to show love. What is the evidence of a purified soul in this context? It's a love for the brethren. Holy living is incomplete if it is not accompanied by love. The Bible is emphatic that if you have been saved, then you will show a sincere love for other believers. The Bible says you are going to have an unfeigned love. Now, we don't use that phrase much in 2024. What is unfeigned love? Well, the idea of being unfeigned literally is being unhypocritical. And so it's actually the word uh, hypocrite in the Greek with an A at the beginning of it, which negates it. That's what it does in the Greek. So if there's a theist, you put an A in front of it, an atheist is a, a non-theist or someone who doesn't believe in God. Someone who knows, a Gnostic, put an A in front of it, an agnostic, and so that's someone who doesn't know. This is the word for hypocrite with an A in front of it. So an unfeigned love is non-hypocritical love. How do we live hypocritically? Well, we live as two-faced. Our love is marked by deliberate deceit, pretending one set of feelings and acting under the influence of another. One of the primary goals of our salvation is that we show sincere love to fellow believers. Now, we're not going to hit this super hard because we dealt four weeks in a row in 1 John on what it means to love the brethren. And so if you want to know what that means, go back to our YouTube channel, listen to all those great sermons from 1 John. Just start in chapter 1 and work your way through the book, okay? That'll take you about three weeks. And so uh, the idea is if you're saved, by, if, the love of, if the love of Christ has shown on you, then the love of Christ will show through you. That's the idea of the Christian life. That's what John is, or Peter is saying. If, if Christ has shown his love to you, and you obey that and you receive that, then the love of Christ will be shown through you. Again, in 1 John, those who say they are saved and don't show love, John says they're not saved. Because there's no way this pure love can come in you and not come out somewhere. And so he says in verse 22, now that you have this pure soul, have a pure love for the brethren. Love for unfeigned. Now, why is it so important that our love be without hypocrisy? Why is it so important that our love be unfeigned? Well, I think one of the reasons would be because the world wears a mask. And the love of the world is behind a mask. People in the world, people who do not know God, people who live according to their own flesh, they oftentimes say one thing while meaning something else. The love of the world shows on the face. It's only external. It's only based on what someone can get or what someone can give. It's not selfless like 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love is supposed to be. People in the world will love you as long as you're lovable. They'll love you as long as you can give money. They'll love you as long as they can get something from you. But as soon as you are no longer of any use, then they will not love you anymore. And there's a lot of broken relationships. There's a lot of hurt feelings because of that kind of false love. People say, yeah, we're friends. We're best friends. I love you. I'm always here for you. And then situations change, circumstances change, and you find out that all of that was not unfeigned. It was hypocritical. The Bible says, listen, we don't want to live like the world. We want to live like Christ. We don't want to have the same kind of superficial, surfacey kind of love that the world says. No, we as Christians, we want to have a pure love. Now, and look where this pure love comes from. Verse 22, with a pure heart. 
So he says in verse 22, see that ye love one another. We could put it this way. See that ye love one another fervently with a pure heart. So make sure this pure love is coming from a pure heart, from the depths of who we are. With a pure heart, it flows unhindered by our sin. It flows unhindered by our hypocrisy. And so the love that we've received by Christ, it shows itself by the actions that we do to other people. We love those, maybe even if they're unlovable or unlovely. We pray for those, even though we don't want to pray for them. We show kindness to them, and we are good to them, because that's how God expects us to live, because that's how he was to us. Now, let's be honest. That kind of love does not come naturally. That kind of pure love from a pure heart, it's not natural, is it? That's why in verse 23, we must be born again. Because if you try to love this kind of way on your own, it's not going to last very long. And so he says in verse 23, being born again. This new birth produces this new kind of love. Now this, this word, this phrase of being born again, if you're not a Baptist or if you weren't raised in a Baptist church uh, when you were younger, that word probably was not part of your vocabulary. If you grew up in like a Catholic church or even a, a Mormon background, the idea of being born again was not something that was brought to the forefront of your religion. But it's a very Bible word. Even John chapter 3, Jesus himself talks about being born again. We are born again. Look what the Bible says in verse 23. We are born again. How? Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. What is this incorruptible seed? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. It's not easy to love this way. It does not come naturally. That's why we must be born again through the incorruptible word of God. You cannot be born again apart from the Word of God. And since the Word of God is pure, it will help you to become pure and to live and love as pure. So that is the pure love. And now we see, lastly, the pure Word. Now, this will be a shorter point, all right? We see the pure Word in verse 24 and 25. Look at how the Word of God is described. It's fantastic. Think about the Bible itself. He says, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. This section of scripture is one of the most remarkable in scripture because it plainly sets God and man in sharp contrast. Human life, however beautiful in appearance, is fleeting and perishing. But God, in His being, in His word, in His purpose, He is eternal and He is enduring. Turn back very quickly to the book of Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Peter thinks back about the writings of the prophet Isaiah when he writes chapter 1. How do we know that? Because he quotes directly from Isaiah. Peter was a fisherman, but he wasn't stupid. He knew the word of God. He was a follower of John the Baptist. Jesus taught Peter and all the disciples the things of the Old Testament. And this is one of the things I'm sure Peter learned around a campfire with Jesus Christ one evening. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. That would, in a way, be John the Baptist. John's ministry was a ministry of preparation. Prepare the way of the Lord, making his paths straight. Verse 4, Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Look at verse 6, 7, and 8. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? Here's the answer. All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth. 
the flower fadeth because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. We see this sharp contrast between humanity and divinity, between man and God, between our glory and the word of God, and everything that deals with man is temporal. All flesh, that's all of humanity, everybody, all flesh, the Bible says, is as grass. And every glory, every man withereth. That literally means to dry up and be parched. So when you see in the spring winds all those tumbleweeds that have been detached and blowing, that's the glory of man. At one time they were growing and green and vibrant, but now they're detached and they're old and they're withering. No matter how much we like it, looks fade. Muscles sag. Our glory fades. I was doing a wedding a couple years ago in Ohio. One of the kids in my youth department in Ohio was getting married to one of the girls in my youth department in Ohio. And so they asked if I would do their wedding. And in their vows, I said, Kaylin, do you promise to, to have and to hold him? You know, and blah, blah, blah. She says, I do. Do you promise through sickness and health? I do. I said, do you promise when he gets a dad bod? And she goes, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> all right. Uh, because let's be honest, that's inevitable. That's what's going to happen. All right. Man is not going to look like a big buff guy all the time, you know, because muscles always fade, looks always fade. Everything always degenerates. Man, in our glory, at our best, we're never always any that, that great. Uh, Tom Brady, I mean, he was at the height of the football fame. He was, in a lot of people's minds, the greatest quarterback of all time, and now he's not even on the field. Now he's a, a broadcaster because his time has passed. Now, he still lives on that money, but he doesn't get any of the spotlight this year because his time is gone. The glory of man, it's just, it's here and it's gone. But there is one thing that endures. It's not your looks. There's one thing that endures. It's not your personality. There's one thing that endures and it has nothing to do with you. The Bible says it's the word of God. It's the word of God that endures. It's not the word of man. It's the word of God. Man's word fails, but God's word stands. When the word of God speaks, it's because God speaks. We see the brevity of man and the permanence of God's word. Our bodies will fail and our glory will fall, but the word of God will endure. Now think about this. Nothing has to endure unless there's hardship. You don't endure good times and easy times. If there were no enemies of the word of God, if there was no no one and nothing to attack the word of God, the word of God would not have to endure, it would simply have to exist. But the Bible says the word of the Lord will endure forever. It'll make it through every single attack that's faced against it. The Bible tells us as good soldiers to endure through hardness. Endure hardness as a good soldier, and the Bible promises that it will always endure the hardness and the attacks that are cast against it. In A.D. 303, the Roman emperor Diocletian demanded every copy of the scriptures of the Roman Empire to be found and burned. Twenty-five years later, the Roman emperor Constantine commissioned a scholar named Eusebius to prepare 50 copies of the Bible at the government's expense. Every attack against the word of God has failed. One man puts it this way, A thousand times over, the death toll of the Bible has been sounded. The funeral procession has formed, the inscription has been cut on the tombstone, and the committal has been read, but somehow the corpse never stays put. Because the word of God will stand forever. It's amazing because the word of God is just not paper. It is the power of God. Gaylord Kambarmi, he was a general secretary of the Bible Society in Zimbabwe. He tried to sell a New Testament to a very belligerent atheist. The man insisted that if he were to buy the Bible, he would rip its pages out and use them to make cigarettes. Mr. Kambarmi said, I won't sell it to you, but I'll give it to you. But understand, or excuse me, I understand that You'll use to make cigarettes, but at least promise to read 
the page of the New Testament before you smoke it. And the man agreed. So he gave the man a Bible, and they went their separate ways. Fifteen years later, Gaylord was at a convention in Zimbabwe, and the scripture-smoking pagan had been saved, and he was now a full-time evangelist. He was the one speaking at this convention, and he pointed out this missionary and told the crowd what he told the man. He tried to sell me a Bible. I told him I would never buy a Bible, so he gave me a Bible. I told him I'm going to use these pages to make cigarettes, but he made me promise that I would read them before I smoked them. And he told the crowd, I smoked Matthew. I smoked Mark. I smoked Luke. But when I got to John, I could smoke no more. He turned his life over to Jesus Christ and became an evangelist. It's amazing that the Word of God is not simply a book. Aren't you glad the Bible is more than just words on paper? It is the power of God. It is the written will of God, the written word of God. And because all Scripture has been given by inspiration of God, that means all Scripture has been God-breathed, nothing can hinder it. The Bible says whatever God wants to accomplish, He will accomplish. It's an amazing promise when you think about it. You and I will always fail. You and I will always fall. But the word of God, the Bible says, will last forever. Matter of fact, the psalmist says it's settled in heaven. There's nothing we can do that can ever hinder the Bible. So let me ask you two questions as we close tonight. Number one, do you have a pure faith? Do you have a pure faith? Is your faith obedient to God? And does your faith show the love of God? If there's never been a time in your life when you've turned from your sin and turned to God for salvation, the Bible says you need to be born again. And it's not hard. It's not some weird mystical thing. It's simply putting your faith and trust in Christ. It's, only, it's faith that saves. And so if you believe that God can save and forgive you, then God can save and He will forgive you. And He'll give you this faith. Do you have a pure faith? Is your faith obedient? Is it loving? You say, well, I mean, I have faith, but it's not as obedient as it should be. I think I, sh- I could be more loving. How do I develop that kind of faith? Well, through the Word of God. That's why we have it. Get into the pure Word of God, because the Word of God is our resource, and the Word of God is our hope. The Word of God is what you need to learn how to live, how to make decisions, how to be discerning, how to live this time away from your home in heaven for the Lord. It's also your hope. Because there's a lot of promises in the Bible that pertain to you. You can overcome. You can endure hardness. You can be faithful because of the promise of the Word of God. Do you know it? And so number one, do you have a pure faith? Number two, do you know the Bible? They go hand in hand. Our faith is connected to the Word of God. And so we see tonight very clearly a pure faith and a pure Word. If you need help with your faith, we have a Word that can help you with it. If you need help walking with God, God's given you His Word. And here's the good news. Nothing in your life, nothing comes against you will ever hinder the Word of God. You can stand on it. You can trust it. You can believe it. Because nothing can stop the Word of God. Because the Bible is not just ink and pages bound in covers of letter. This is the inspired words of God. The Bible says it's settled in heaven and it will endure And so if this will endure, then we can trust it. Don't trust me. Don't put your faith in me. Why? Because I'm not going to endure. I'll be here for another 40 or 50 years, and I'm out of here. I'm I'm going to heaven. I'll be dead. Don't put your faith in me. I'm going to fail. I'm going to fall. But you can put your faith in the Word of God because it will endure forever. And so do you have a pure faith, and do you know the pure Word? If not, you can begin your faith tonight. You can get in the Word of God this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. And Father, we love you. And we're so grateful that you've given to us a word that we can read, that we can understand, and that we can trust. Our faith needs to be in something that is substantial. Our faith cannot be in ourselves because we will fail. Our faith cannot be in what we accomplish because what we accomplish is never perfect. It's never going to endure. But Father, we thank you that our faith can be in a word, your Bible, your scripture, and it will endure forever. Since the dawn of time, Satan has been trying to hinder and silence your word. 
and he has never and will never be successful. So, Father, help us to live by what your word says. Help us to get into it. Help us read it. Help us to memorize it. Help us live by it. Father, help our faith to be on it. And, Father, as we stand on your firm word, our faith can be firm, and we can be strengthened, settled, and perfect because we stand on something that is perfect. Thank you for loving us, Father. Please give us faith, hope, and charity this week. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here tonight. Make sure you go back and say hey to the kids back.